Good morning. Welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. Glad that you could come and worship with us this morning. If you're a visitor this morning, we have just started a study in the book of Mark, and we are still in chapter 1. If you want to turn to Mark chapter 1, our passage this morning will be verses 21 to 34. If I were going to give this sermon a title, I would call it A Day in the Life of Jesus, because that's what this is. It's a very distinct account of a day in the life of Christ, actually a Sabbath day. So beginning in Mark chapter 1, verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in, the, in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now as we hear that, it's important to remember that Mark wasn't just chronicling some events from a day in the life of Christ so that we would know what a typical day was like. And these aren't just random events that are presented for us to be impressed with Jesus' power. No, the Holy Spirit had very specific reasons for drawing these things out for us to consider in this passage. And part of our job as we study this book, not just this morning, but every time we come to the book of Mark, is to try to understand why the Holy Spirit picked certain events and certain details to record and left others out. Now, we know that Mark is writing this gospel to convince people in the Roman Empire that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is in fact God and the Savior. So let's keep that in the forefront of our minds as we move ahead. What does the Holy Spirit want us to know about what we have on this account of this day? Let's pray first. Father, we come to you as hungry people. We need your word. Just as our bodies need bread, we need your word. We need you to speak it to us in power. Every single person in this room is in a different place, a different story. Lord, I'm asking you to miraculously meet us where we are and to feed us. If there's anybody here who doesn't know you, Father, I ask you to reach their heart with your grace. Give them the faith and the courage to cry out to you. I pray it in Jesus' name. All right, so let's start in verse 21. It says, and they went into Capernaum. And yeah, okay, so how do you pronounce that word? Some people say Capernaum. Some people say Capernaum. I think in Hebrew it's Kafar uh, Nahum, which means the village of Nahum. Um, and it probably was the village of the prophet Nahum. Um, so I'm just going to keep butchering it with Capernaum. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. Now, I have to admit, as I read that, I'm frustrated simply because then it moves on, and it doesn't tell us what Jesus actually was teaching. I want to know, what was the lesson? Um, now, I don't think it's completely in the dark. If you look up at verse 14, we get a hint 
what he was preaching. In verse 14, it said, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So whatever words Jesus used and whatever parables he might have told that morning, we know this, he was declaring the kingdom of God and he was saying, repent and believe. Now when he says the kingdom of God, this isn't like Conant said last week, this isn't some territory, but rather the internal, invisible, eternal rule of God in the lives of his people. Notice verse 15 again. It says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Notice the effects of this kingdom. It's a change of heart. Repent and believe. And, and what does he mean when he says the kingdom of God is at hand? Well, where the king is, there is the kingdom. When Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, he's saying, it's right here in front of you. It's staring you in the face. I'm the king. Repent and believe. So Mark puts this fact right out in front of us, right here in, in the very first chapter. The kingdom of God is here because Jesus is here. Jesus says, my kingdom on earth isn't going to be marked by palaces and pomp and ceremony, but it's going to be internal and invisible. A rule of God in the hearts of people who are willing to trust him. So in verse 15... The kingdom of God is directly linked to people believing and repenting, turning from their sin, turning from darkness to light. This king didn't come to set up utop utopia on earth. His, his um, campaign slogan would have been something like, come to me and I'll give you persecution and a cross. This isn't utopia, at least not yet. That's coming but he came to seek and to save the lost in enemy territory. And Mark is determined in this book to let us know that Jesus is that king. And he gives us a glimpse of him here on this single day, on a Sabbath day, and he intends to show us that Jesus' rule, Jesus' authority is comprehensive, it's absolute. He is God. So in our passage this morning, we're going to see that Jesus has authority in three realms. He has authority in the realm of ideas, in the realm of truth. He has authority over ignorance. Second, we're going to see that he has authority over devils and demons. He has authority in the spiritual realm. And third, we're going to see that he has authority in the physical realm, authority over sickness even. Now, this passage is all about Jesus not you. And I feel compelled in this day and age to, to put that out there right here at the beginning. This passage was given to us to validate Jesus Christ as the king. It's about him, not you. And I know that sounds obvious, but I still, in this day and age, I feel like I have to say that with the prosperity preachers out there. God didn't write this so that since people were amazed at Jesus' teaching, if you were really spiritual, then people would be amazed at your teaching. Or since Jesus cast out demons, if you were really walking in the Spirit, you'd be casting out demons too. Or since Jesus healed people, then if you were, you know, really a godly person, you'd be healing people on every street corner too. No, no. This passage was written to proclaim loud and clear that Jesus Christ is the king. Not a king, the king of kings. Mark wants us to see his authority, even as a human on this earth. So in verse 21, it says that Jesus went into the synagogue there in Capernaum and he taught. And that was normal. It was normal for Jesus and it would have been normal for, for a synagogue. Now a synagogue is simply a gathering of 10 or more Jewish people, adults, in a single place. Synagogues kind of came into prominence during the exile, the Babylonian exile, after the temple had been destroyed. Jews all over in the diaspora would meet together in villages, and if you had 10 or more, that was considered to be a synagogue. And as time went along, then they started to build buildings for their meeting, and the building became known as a synagogue. 
and um, really, but the, really the word synagogue, synagogue in Greek means congregation, gathering, that's all it was. And each synagogue would have a ruler or, or a leader. Now this person wasn't really synonymous with a pastor, this guy was more of an administrator. He took care of the building and he organized the meetings for the week, probably organized a school in that building during the week. And then on the Sabbath, he would organize somebody to lead in prayer and people to do all the readings. And then he would invite somebody to come forward and give the teaching, give a sermon on that morning. And since the synagogue was the center of, of religious and educational and social life in every Jewish village, it was natural that that's where Jesus went when he went into a town or a village. Very frequently in the Gospels, we see that when Jesus enters a town, he goes to the synagogue because that's the center of, of Jewish life. In Mark 4.16, it mentions Jesus going into a synagogue, quote, as was his custom. It was his habit. So here in Mark 1.21, Jesus and his disciples, they would have entered the synagogue that morning. They would have participated in prayers and worship. Uh, certainly the recitation of the Shema. Then they would have listened to various men get up and read from standing, read from the scriptures. And then at some point, Jesus, being a rabbi, it was natural, he would have been invited to come and teach. And so he would go up in front of everybody and sit down on the seat of Moses. In, in the synagogue, people stood for the reading of God's word and the, and the readers would stand. But when it came to the teaching, then, this, then everybody would sit and the speaker would sit. I think it's a real clear message being sent. <laughs> this is from God. This isn't necessarily from God. It was a very clear message. And that was true then. It's true today. Be careful what you trust. So here in Mark uh, 121, we don't know exactly what he said, but we do know that everybody there was astonished. Some of the versions say that they, were, that they were amazed or utterly amazed. One translator said the Greek word used here literally means to strike with panic, causing the viewer to gape with, with amazement. In other words, these people were completely floored by the authority that Jesus wielded with his words. Verse 20 says, 22 says, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as one of the scribes. The scribes were experts in the law, and, and so they taught the Old Testament, and they made judicial rulings on the law in the community. Uh, and, and most of them were Pharisees. Not all the Pharisees were skilled enough in the law or trained well enough in the law to be scribes. But the thing about the scribes was that when they spoke, they had to cite other scribes or refer to other rabbis and their opinions if they're trying to make a point, not Jesus. There's something completely unique about what Jesus brought. I think it's good. I think anybody who's doing good scholarship would do their research and cite their sources, but whatever they cited, the scribe cited, wasn't original. There was something completely and utterly different about Jesus. Even the prophets in the Old Testament, whenever they spoke the word of God, they always prefaced it with a phrase like, the Lord says, thus says the Lord, not Jesus. Now, when Jesus spoke, he never had to appeal to any other source. The only source that he had was he himself. God Almighty. Jesus is the word of God, according to John chapter 1. When Jesus was in a storm, did Jesus ask the Father to calm the storm? Did Jesus ask the storm to be calm? No, Jesus simply commanded the waves, and they obeyed his voice, because he is God Almighty. Turn with me, if you would, real quickly to Colossians chapter 1. We're not going to do a whole lot of turning today, but uh, Colossians chapter 1 is worth looking at. Colossians 1 is describing Jesus as God, Almighty God. Now, I did this. I, I actually 
had this exact same teaching a couple of years ago, but it, it is worth repeating. This, this feeds my soul. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 13, says, He, God, has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, meaning the beloved Son, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. Creation was created by Jesus. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's Jesus. He's the creator God. Now, hold that thought and quickly turn over to Psalm 33. Remembering that all things were created by Jesus, Psalm 33, verse 6, says this. By the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Think about that for a second. That's Jesus. Billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy in a universe that is at least 92 billion light years in diameter. A light year is what, 5.88 trillion miles? So multiply 5.88 trillion times 92 billion, and Jesus breathed it out with the word of his mouth. Stars so huge that they would dwarf our little sun like a speck. And he breathed them out. So when we go to this synagogue on this Sabbath day and we see this average looking Jewish gentleman teaching from the seat of Moses, don't be fooled by appearances. This is the star breathing God who once spoke the cosmos into existence. So when Jesus preached in that synagogue that day, he didn't just sit there and try to explain God's word. He spoke God's word because he is God. He didn't explain truth. His word is truth. He didn't talk about light. His word is light. And the people were amazed. They were stunned that this person spoke with such authority and such power, and they didn't know what to make of it. But they knew this. They knew this rabbi had authority. They knew this rabbi spoke the truth with authority. They didn't understand all the implications of it, but they were amazed. Now, there was someone in that synagogue that Saturday who understood everything that was going on. Look at verse 23. It says, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Okay, he had been there all along, wasn't he didn't just show up. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Now, if the people in that synagogue that day were stunned by Jesus' teaching, this demon was terrified. And he cries out. He literally shouted. And I'm pretty sure that the word immediately there implies that Jesus was still teaching when this little imp interrupted him. Now, I, th I think the little guy, the, the, the man with the demon had been in the congregation the whole time. But the demon was happy. I, I don't, the people wouldn't have allowed this man in the congregation if, if, if he was foaming, foaming at the mouth or throwing himself down. No, he was acting as though everything was okay. The demon was fine as long as these people were focused on the law, as long as all these people were trying to earn their way to heaven with the law and didn't feel a need for the Savior. This demon was more than happy to let them live in their darkness and their confusion. And then the king of light invaded his territory and he shouts out, what do you have to do with us? Have you come to destroy us? calls him Jesus of Nazareth. 
How ironic is that, that this demon, out of all the people there that day, the Pharisees, the scribes, the disciples, only one understood what was going on. It was a demon. The demon was having a good old time sowing darkness in this place, and then God showed up in person, and this demon was horrified. He knew all about Jesus, and he knew why Jesus had come. Do you remember 1 John chapter 3, verse 8? It says, that's 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, if you're writing them down. It says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So this demon shouts out, what are you doing here? Have you come to destroy us? Is our time up? I know who you are, and I know what you came to do. Did the clock run out? This demon understands. He knows exactly who this is. He calls him Jesus of Nazareth. He knows that God, at a point in history, stepped off his throne and stepped into human history and grew up in a town called Nazareth. But this devil also knows that that did not diminish the son's power at all, that the son still had the power to destroy him on a whim if he wanted. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Isn't that interesting? The Holy One of God. Now, in verse 23, Mark described this demon as an unclean spirit. So not only is this demon's darkness threatened by the light, but this demon's filthiness is threatened by the holiness of God standing right there face to face in front of him. And he's shaking in his boots. I can't say that without thinking of James chapter 2, verse 19, where it says, even the demons believe and shudder, tremble. But there's a lesson in that for us, isn't there? It is possible to know everything there is to know about Jesus Christ, even to meet him face to face and not get saved. Meet him face to face and not want to love him and not want to worship him. The demons know all the truth there is to know about Jesus, but they refuse to bow. It's not that they don't understand his rule. It's not that they don't understand his kingdom. It's that his rule is unwelcome. It's unwanted and it's resented. What about you? A knowledge of God without a heart for God is useless and it's dangerous. And there are many people around us in that boat today. They know the truth. They know that Jesus is Lord, but they can't call him my Lord, just like this demon, because they can't bear the thought of submitting to his lordship. That's demonic thinking. That's falling in line with the way this demon was thinking. See, you don't have to have a demon possess a person and speak through him in a raspy voice and turn a girl's head around in order to manifest itself as a demon. No. They manifest themselves every time arrogant people chafe under the lordship of King Jesus and decide to do it their way. It's the thinking of devils. So again I ask, what about you? Do you know the truth about something but refuse Christ's lordship in that matter? That's the influence of demonic thinking. When I decide that my way is better than God's way, that's a lie of the devil. So we don't have to be possessed or attacked by a personal demon if we're willing to listen to their lies. Lies that are all around us in our world and in our culture today. Anyway, so this demon cries out, he interrupts Jesus, Not only is he afraid of Jesus, but he hates Jesus, and he doesn't want Jesus to continue with this lesson, and so he screams out and interrupts the service, and he plays right into the hands of Christ. Remember, the devil is God's devil, and and Jesus, he knew from the time he got started that morning, he knew that demon was in their midst, and Jesus baited him, brought him out in public so he could show his authority here. He could have destroyed this demon right then, right there, but he doesn't. Look at verse 25. It says, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of here. In other words, more literally, shut up and leave. And the demon left. 
He had to because Jesus said so, because Jesus is God. Now, I, the demon wasn't happy. He threw a little temper tantrum on the way out and threw this guy into a convulsion and he screamed in a loud voice, but he couldn't say anymore because Jesus had told him to stop talking. This demon was powerless before Jesus. Now, please notice that Jesus doesn't have to have some ceremony here. There was no shouting match between Jesus and the powers of darkness. There was no potion or lotion or cross or Bible or, or juju or incantation that had to take place. Jesus simply made a clear command, go, and the demon obeyed because he had to. He wasn't happy, but he didn't have a choice. See, Jesus not only shows us his authority in his teaching, his authority over ignorance, but he has the authority over the demons and the devils in the spiritual realm. And all the people were amazed, it says in verse 27. So they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Mission accomplished. Jesus simply wanted people to know that the kingdom was, was at hand and that he was the king and that he has authority. But Jesus' rule and his authority isn't just over the prince of darkness. His authority is actually over all darkness, over every place that the curse is found, including sickness. Look at verse 29. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with fever, and immediately they told her about him. Apparently she was in another room when they entered. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her and she began to serve them. So Jesus leaves the synagogue and immediately is at Peter's house. Seems to indicate that Peter's house is really close. I'm not going to go into detail this morning, but if you're looking for a cool little Google search this afternoon, research Peter's house in Capernaum and synagogue all in the same search, and there's actually some pretty cool archaeological evidence that a house that fits the description of Peter's house was right next door to a synagogue in Capernaum. Now, I think it's interesting that Peter had a house in Capernaum because we're told elsewhere that Peter is from Bethsaida. So what is it? Is he from Capernaum or is he from Bethsaida? I think the, the answer to that is, is probably both. I've heard a lot of other preachers, teachers say that there's a really good chance that Peter had two homes. Just because the Jewish leaders in the book of Acts call Peter an uneducated, ignorant man doesn't mean that he was. They called Jesus a blasphemer. They were wrong sometimes. Don't underestimate Peter. I think he was a very shrewd, very successful businessman. He had, he had a crew. He had more than one crew that worked for him. He had to deal with all of the rules and regulations and taxes of the Romans and all the rules and regulations and taxes of the Jews, and he still was able to make a thriving business in all of that. And he had two homes. It's kind of cool. But his mother-in-law was sick. I love this. So Jesus goes from this very public display of his authority into Peter's house just to kick back and relax for the afternoon. And they come to him and they say, Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And so he comes to this dear woman and he, and he reaches out and he takes her by the hand and he lifts her up. What a good idea if someone's sick, go tell Jesus. Why not do that first? instead of trying the pills and the doctors, tell Jesus about it. So Jesus takes this dear woman by the hand and lifts her up, and all of a sudden she gets up, and the fever leaves, and she serves them. And I guess I should comment on this. I wish I didn't have to, but I'm sure that there are some who read this and see chauvinism and even misogyny. Right? Ah, Jesus, he just healed her so this poor woman could get up and work. Can't have a woman laying around. <laughs> Why couldn't they just let the poor woman lay there and rest? And make yourself some lunch. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, as, as Paul says in Titus, to the pure, all things are pure. To the corrupt, ain't nothing pure. So they, they can't even look at this amazing healing that Jesus performed for this dear woman without seeing their own 
political hobby horse. Jesus healed this lady because she was sick, period. And when she was well, she wanted to do what she would have done had she not been sick. She wanted to do what was her normal custom. If somebody came to her home, she wanted to show hospitality. And now that her health was restored, she was happy that she had the strength to serve. Mark doesn't share that detail about this woman getting up and serving them to put her down or to put women down. He shared it because the Holy Spirit wants us to see that it's not just that the fever left, left the woman, but that she got her energy back. As soon as the fever left her, she was completely restored. That's what the healing of God is like. She didn't have that flu hangover that you and I get when we get over the flu. You know, you, you know the flu's gone and you feel better, but it takes a day or two for you to get your energy back. Not her. Mark wants us to know that Jesus' kingly rule is absolute. When Jesus healed this lady, I don't think she had felt that good in a long time. <laughs> And she wanted to get up and do something. So she served him. That's beautiful. Don't make it ugly. Another thing I see here is, you know, you don't have to go into a jungle to serve God. When Jesus healed this woman, she didn't jump up and start preaching the gospel. She didn't go out and start a, 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 a foundation to feed the poor. She went in the kitchen and made lunch for these guys, for Peter and his friends. That's what she did. Parents, when you're serving your family and you feel like you're in the drudgery of the mundane and the tiresome details of life, I want you to remember this, that your service to your family is not trivial and it's not insignificant. It is divine service. I'm told that Ruth Graham had a, had a sign over her sink in her kitchen where she did dishes every day. And the sign read, divine service performed here daily. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it as unto the Lord. And he receives it that way. Now, it's getting late. The sun's going down. In verse 32, it says, that evening at sundown, they brought him all that were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, up until this point in the day, it was the Sabbath. It was Saturday. It was Sabbath all day long. But when the sun goes down, that's the end of the Sabbath. And the people then were free to bring their sick and to bring those who were possessed. And it sounds like they just flocked to him. They flocked to Peter's house. Now, people had either seen him at the, at the synagogue that morning or they had heard what had happened at the synagogue, and so they brought all of their sick and possessed and literally came to the door. I think Mark wants us to, to see the intensity of this, of this onslaught. In fact, I think Mark uses hyperbole here when he says the whole city was at the door. Archaeology tells us that would be about 10,000 people at the door. But I think Mark simply wants us to see the pandemonium that Jesus' presence created. These people are compelled by curiosity and some by physical need and spiritual need. But more than anything, they just wanted to see the magic worker, the magician, not Jesus. They didn't care about Jesus. They wanted to see a miracle. They weren't looking for Jesus' majesty. See, Jesus did miracles so that they would work as signs pointing to him as the king. But they wanted to see tricks. They wanted him to do more of what he had done during the day. It was curiosity, not conviction, that drove them. But Jesus healed them just the same. I think he was grieved in his heart by this. I think we'll see that next week in, in Joel's passage in the next paragraph. Uh, Jesus gets up the next morning and he leaves Capernaum. He didn't want to be the miracle worker, the trickster. He wanted people to seek him for who he was. That's why he came. Now, please understand, Jesus didn't come to heal everyone who was sick in Israel, and he wasn't there to round up all the demons and throw them all into the pit, at least not yet. That's going to happen. You can read all about it in Revelation chapter 20, 21. 
But at this point in time, in Mark 1, Jesus simply wants people to see him for who he really is, the king who's bringing in his kingdom. Do you remember what John wrote at the end of his gospel, chapter 20? Not quite the end, chapter 20, verse 21, 31. He said, a lot of other things Jesus did, I could have written down. But these have been written so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing in him, you might find life. The purpose of Jesus' healings, then and now, is simply so we can see Jesus more clearly. It's not to alleviate all suffering. It's not to get rid of every single demon that's on the earth. Jesus could have done that, and he didn't. He let them be. He sent them out to go somewhere else. He sent them into the pigs. He, he didn't banish them. They, they feared that. They feared that he was going to destroy them or send them into the abyss. He certainly had the power to do that, and we know that some demons, that has been their fate, that they have already been bound and thrown into the abyss, waiting for judgment. But there still is sickness, and there still is demonic activity on the earth. Now, what, what Jesus wants us to see, what Mark wants us to see, is that Jesus is the king, and he has all authority in heaven and on earth. See, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He, he, he knows that just healing a person's body is not necessarily going to win their heart. And he knows that casting demons out of a bunch of people is not necessarily going to win their hearts. And Jesus came to win our hearts. He exercises authority in the realm of truth. We see that here. He exercises authority in the realm of the spiritual. We see that here. He exercises authority in the realm of the physical. We see that here. But he's not going to exercise his authority in your life and force you to trust him or love him. That's your decision. You have to give him that place of authority in your life. When we worked with demon-possessed people in West Africa, we never had a power encounter with these demons like Jesus did in the scriptures, because for one, I'm, I'm not Jesus. So what we would do is we would simply try to lead people to Christ and then get them to take authority in their own life to get the demon out. My concern was always if a demon leaves a, a non-Christian, and they don't allow Christ into their heart, well, Jesus said the next state of the person is going to be worse than the first because that demon is going to come back and bring more. Why? Because even though God is the God of all, and he has all authority, he has given us autonomy in our hearts to choose him or not. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone will open the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The door of your life, Jesus says, if you will open it, I will come in and we can fellowship. He's not going to kick that door down. He's not going to force his way in. He could. He has all power and all authority to do it. But that's not the way he operates. If you're here this morning and you're convinced that Jesus is God, and that if you died today, you would die in your sins, and you wouldn't go to heaven, would you trust him? I'm here to invite you to do that this morning. If you've come to that point in your heart, then it's time. All I'm asking you is put your hand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to have you come up here. You can go back and talk to somebody in the back. But if you want to trust Christ this morning, here's your opportunity. Don't let it pass. Now, if you are a believer, did you know that Revelation 3.20 wasn't written to unbelievers? It was actually written to believers with a sin problem? Maybe the door that he's knocking at this morning is not the door of your life. Maybe it's a door, a hidden door somewhere in some dark hallway in your life that you've chosen to keep to yourself. And that 
you would be embarrassed if Jesus opened up that door. Maybe that's the knocking you're hearing this morning. If you haven't done that, if you haven't turned over rule of that place in your heart this morning, I'm inviting you to do so now. Will you give it to him? Trust him with it? You have to open that door for him. He's not going to kick it down. Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, I just don't have the strength to deal with that. I don't have the energy to deal with this right now. Can I remind you who we're talking about here? We're talking about the star-breathing God. We're talking about the one who spoke the cosmos into existence with a single word. He can speak light into your darkness and life into your deadness and healing into your brokenness. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. Trust him and repent. He comes to us today in this passage and he says, I am the king. Repent and believe. We all have a decision to make. Who's going to rule in our lives? Either he is or you are or something else will. But it's a daily decision. Moment by moment decision. That's why Jesus says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross first and deny yourself and follow me. Are you willing? Let's pray. Father, we, so many people worry about predestination and oh, that takes away our freedom and yet when we come face to face with the, the responsibility of the freedom we have that we could actually shut you out of parts of our life because of the authority that you've and the freedom that you've granted us Lord it's a frightening thing I know some of us would rather you just kick in those doors and, and take us over and yet you've given us the responsibility to yield the parts of our body and the parts of our life and the parts of our spirit to you as instruments of righteousness and we pray Lord for the grace and the courage and the faith to do that today. Knowing who you are, how good and how powerful you are. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.